Chapter Twenty Five, Part Eight of Volume Three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Mackenzie. Volume Three of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Twenty Five, Louis the Eleventh, fourteen sixty one to fourteen eighty three, Part Eight but events take no account of the fears and weaknesses of men charles learned before long that the swiss were not his most threatening foes and that he had something else to do instead of going after them amongst their mountains during his two campaigns against them the duke of lorraine rene the second whom he had despoiled of his dominions and driven from nancy had been wandering amongst neighbouring princes and people in france germany and switzerland at the courts of Louis the Eleventh and the Emperor Frederick the Third, on visits to the patricians of Bern, and in the free towns of the Rhine, he was young, sprightly, amiable, and brave. He had nowhere met with great assistance, but he had been well received, and certain promises had been made him. When he saw the contest so hotly commenced between the Duke of Burgundy and the Swiss, he resolutely put himself at the service of the republican mountaineers fought for them in their ranks and powerfully contributed to their victory at morat the defeat of charles and his retreat to his castle of la riviere gave rene new hopes and gained him some credit amongst the powers which had hitherto merely testified towards him a good will of but little value and his partisans in lorraine recovered confidence in his fortunes one day as he was at his prayers in a church a rich widow madame walter came up to him in her mantle and hood, made him a deep reverence, and handed him a purse of gold to help him in winning back his duchy. The city of Strasbourg gave him some cannon, four hundred cavalry, and eight hundred infantry. Louis the Eleventh lent him some money, and René, before long, found himself in a position to raise a small army and retake Epinal, Sondit, Vaudemont, and the majority of the small towns in Lorraine he then went and laid siege to nancy the duke of burgundy had left there as governor jean de robemore lord of bievre with a feeble garrison which numbered amongst its ranks three hundred english picked men sire de bievre sent message after message to charles who did not even reply to him the town was short of provisions the garrison was dispirited and the commander of the english was killed sire de bievre a loyal servant but a soldier of but little energy determined to capitulate on the sixth of october fourteen seventy six he evacuated the place at the head of his men all safe in person and property at sight of him rene dismounted and handsomely went forward to meet him saying sir my good uncle i thank you for having so courteously governed my duchy if you find it agreeable to remain with me you shall fare the same as myself sir answered sire de bievre i hope that you will not think ill of me for this war i very much wish that my lord of burgundy had never begun it and i am much afraid that neither he nor i will see the end of it sire de bievre had no idea how true a prophet he was almost at the very moment when he was capitulating duke charles throwing off his sombre apathy was once more entering lorraine with all the troops he could collect and on the twenty second of october he in his turn went and laid siege to nancy duke rene not considering himself in a position to maintain the contest with only such forces as he had with him determined to quit nancy in person and go in search of reinforcements at a distance at the same time leaving in the town a not very numerous but a devoted garrison which together with the inhabitants promised to hold out for two months and it did hold out whilst rene was visiting strasbourg bern zurich and Luzern presenting himself before the councils of these petty republics with in order to please them a tame bear behind him which he left at the doors and promising thanks to louis the eleventh's agents in switzerland extraordinary pay he thus obtained auxiliaries to the number of eight thousand fighting men he had moreover in the very camp of the duke of burgundy a secret ally an italian condottiere the count of campobasso who either from personal hatred or on grounds of interest was betraying the master to whom he had bound himself the year before he had made an offer to louis the eleventh to go over to him with his troops during a battle 
or to hand over to him the Duke of Burgundy, dead or alive. Louis mistrusted the traitor, and sent Charles notice of the offers made by Campo Basso. But Charles mistrusted Louis's information, and kept Campo Basso in his service. A little before the Battle of Morat, Louis had thought better of his scruples or his doubts, and had accepted, with the compensation of a pension, the kind offices of Campo Basso. When the war took place in Lorraine, the condottiere, whom Duke Charles had one day grossly insulted, entered into communication with Duke René also, and took secret measures for ensuring the failure of the Burgundian attempts upon Nancy. Such was the position of the two princes and the two armies, when, on the 4th of June, 1477, René, having returned with reinforcements to Lorraine, found himself confronted with Charles, who was still intent upon the siege of Nancy. The Duke of Burgundy assembled his captains. Well, said he, since these drunken scoundrels are upon us, and are coming here to look for meat and drink, what ought we to do? The majority of those present were of opinion that the right thing to do was to fall back into the duchy of Luxembourg, there to recruit the enfeebled army. Duke René, they said, is poor. He will not be able to bear very long the expense of the war, and his allies will leave him as soon as he has no more money. Wait but a little, and success is certain. Charles flew into a passion. "'My father and I,' said he, "'knew how to thrash these Lorrainers, and we will make them remember it. By St. George!' I will not fly before a boy, before René of Vaudemont, who is coming at the head of this scum. He has not so many men with him as people think. The Germans have no idea of leaving their stoves in winter. This evening we will deliver the assault against the town, and tomorrow we will give battle. And the next day, January the 5th, the battle did take place in the plain of Nancy. The Duke of Burgundy assumed his armour very early in the morning. When he put on his helmet, the gilt lion, which formed the crest of it, fell off. "'That is a sign from God,' said he, but nevertheless he went and drew up his army in line of battle. The day but one before, Campo Basso had drawn off his troops to a considerable distance, and he presented himself before Duke René, having taken off his red scarf and his cross of St. Andrew, and being quite ready, he said, to give proofs of his zeal on the spot. René spoke about it to his Swiss captains. "'We have no mind,' said they, "'to have this traitor of an Italian fighting beside us. "'Our fathers never made use of such folk "'or such practices in order to conquer.' "'And Campobasso held aloof. "'The battle began in gloomy weather, "'and beneath heavy flakes of snow lasted but a short time, "'and was not at all murderous in the actual conflict, "'but the pursuit was terrible. "'Campobasso and his troops held the bridge of Buxières, "'by which the Burgundian fugitives would want to pass.' and the Lorrainers of René and his Swiss and German allies scoured the country, killing all with whom they fell in. René returned to Nancy in the midst of a population whom his victory had delivered from famine as well as war. To show him what sufferings they had endured, says Monsieur de Barante, they conceived the idea of piling up in a heap, before the door of his hostel, the heads of the horses, dogs, mules, cats, and other unclean animals, which had, for several weeks past, been the only food of the besieged. When the first burst of joy was over, the question was, what had become of the Duke of Burgundy? Nobody had a notion, and his body was not found amongst the dead in any of the places where his most valiant and faithful warriors had fallen. The rumour ran that he was not dead. Some said that one of his servants had picked him up wounded on the field of battle and was taking care of him, none knew where, and according to others, a German lord had made him prisoner and carried him off beyond the Rhine. Take good heed, said many people, how ye comport yourselves otherwise than if he were still alive, for his vengeance would be terrible on his return. On the evening of the day after the battle, the Count of Campo Basso brought to Duke René a young Roman page who, he said, had from a distance seen his master fall, and could easily find the spot again. Under his guidance a move was made towards a pond hard by the town, and there, Half buried in the slush of the pond were some dead bodies lying stripped. A poor washerwoman, amongst the rest, had joined in the search. She saw the glitter of a jewel in the ring upon one of the fingers of a corpse whose face was not visible. She went forward, turned the body over, and at once cried, "'Ah, oh, my prince!' 
there was a rush to the spot immediately. As the head was being detached from the ice to which it stuck, the skin came off, and a large wound was discovered. On examining the body with care, it was unhesitatingly recognized to be that of Charles, by his doctor, by his chaplain, by Olivier de la Marche, his chamberlain, and by several grooms of the chamber. And certain marks, such as the scar of the wound he had received at Montlhery, and the loss of two teeth, put their assertion beyond a doubt. As soon as Duke René knew that they had at last found the body of the Duke of Burgundy, he had it removed to the town, and laid on a bed of state, of black velvet under a canopy of black satin. It was dressed in a garment of white satin. A ducal crown set with precious stones was placed on the disfigured brow. The lower limbs were cased in scarlet, and on the heels were gilded spurs. The Duke of Lorraine went and sprinkled holy water on the corpse of his unhappy rival, and, taking the dead hand beneath the pall, "'Ah, oh, dear cousin,' said he, with tears in his eyes, "'for the time that I knew him he was not cruel, but he became so before his death, and that was a bad omen for a long existence. He was very sumptuous in dress and in all other matters, and a little too much so. He showed very great honour to ambassadors and foreign folks they were right well feasted and entertained by him. He was desirous of great glory, and it was that more than aught else that brought him into his wars. He would have been right glad to be like to those ancient princes of whom there has been so much talk after their death. He was as bold a man as any that reigned in his day. After the long felicity and great riches of this house of Burgundy, and after three great princes, good and wise, who had lasted six score years and more in good sense and virtue, God gave this people the Duke Charles, who kept them constantly in great war, travail, and expense, and almost as much in winter as in summer. Many rich and comfortable folks were dead or ruined in prison during these wars. The great losses began in front of Neus, and continued through three or four battles up to the hour of his death, and at that hour all the strength of his country was sapped, and dead or ruined or captive were all who could or would have defended the dominions and the honour of his house. Thus it seems that this loss was an equal set-off to the time of their felicity. Please God to forgive Duke Charles his sins. To this pious wish of Comines, after so judicious a sketch, we may add another. Please God that people may no more suffer themselves to be taken captive by the corrupting and ruinous pleasures procured for them by their master's grand but wicked or foolish enterprises, and may learn to give to the men who govern them a glory in proportion to the wisdom and justice of their deeds, and by no means to the noise they make and the risks they so broadcast around them. The news of the death of Charles the Rash was, for Louis the Eleventh an unexpected and unhoped-for blessing, and one in which he could scarcely believe. The news reached him on the ninth of January, at the castle of plessis les tours by the medium of a courier sent to him by Georges de la Tremoille, Sire de Croix, commanding his troops on the frontier of Lorraine. Insomuch as this house of Burgundy was greater and more powerful than the others, says Comines, was the pleasure great for the king more than all the others together. It was the joy of seeing himself set above all those he hated, and above his principal foes. It might well seem to him that he would never in his life meet any to gainsay him in his kingdom, or in the neighbourhood near him. He replied the same day to Sire de Crown, Sir Count, my good friend, I have received your letters, and the good news you have brought to my knowledge, for which I thank you as much as I am able. Now is the time for you to employ all your five natural wits to put the duchy and countship of Burgundy in my hands, and, to that end, place yourself with your band and the governor of Champagne, if so be that the Duke of Burgundy is dead within the said country, and take care for the dear love you bear me, that you maintain amongst the men of war the best order, just as if you were inside Paris, and make known to them that I am minded to treat them and keep them better than any in my kingdom, and that, in respect of our goddaughter, I have an intention of completing the marriage that I have already had in contemplation between the Lord, the Dauphin, and her. Sir Count, I consider it understood that you will not enter the said country or make mention of that which is written above unless the Duke of Burgundy be dead. And in any case, I pray you to serve me in accordance with the confidence I have in you, and adieu. 
Beneath the discreet reserve inspired by a remnant of doubt concerning the death of his enemy, this letter contained the essence of Louis XI's grand and very natural stroke of policy. Charles the Rash had left only a daughter, Mary of Burgundy, sole heiress of all his dominions. To annex this magnificent heritage to the crown of France by the marriage of the heiress with the Dauphin, who was one day to be Charles the Eighth, was clearly for the best interests of the nation as well as of the French kingship, and such had, accordingly, been Louis the Eleventh's first idea. When the Duke of Burgundy was still alive, said Commines, many a time spoke the king to me of what he would do if the duke should happen to die, and he spoke most reasonably, saying that he would try to make a match between his son, who is now our king, and the said duke's daughter, who was afterwards Duchess of Austria, and if she were not minded to hear of it, for that my lord the Dauphin was much younger than she, he would essay to get her married to some younger lord of this realm, for to keep her and her subject in amity, and to recover without dispute that which he claimed as his. And still was the said lord on this subject a week before he knew of the said duke's death. Howbeit it seems that the king our master took no hold of matters by the end by which he should have taken hold for to come out triumphant, and to add to his crown all those great lordships, either by sound title or by marriage, as easily he might have done. Camine does not explain or specify clearly the mistake with which he reproaches his master. Louis the Eleventh, in spite of his sound sense and correct appreciation generally of the political interests of France and of his crown, allowed himself on this great occasion to be swayed by secondary considerations and personal questions. His son's marriage with the heiress of Burgundy might cause some embarrassment in his relations with Edward the Fourth, King of England, to whom he had promised the Dauphin as a husband for his daughter, Elizabeth, who was already sometimes called in England the Dauphiness. In 1477, at the death of the Duke of her father, Mary of Burgundy was twenty years old, and Charles the Dauphin was barely eight. There was another question, a point of feudal law, as to whether Burgundy, properly so called, was a fief which women could inherit, or a fief which, in default of a male heir, must lapse to the suzerain. Several of the Flemish towns which belonged to the Duke of Burgundy were weary of his wars and his violence, and showed an inclination to pass over to the sway of the King of France. All these facts offered pretexts, opportunities, and chances of success for that course of egotistical pretension and cunning intrigue in which Louis delighted and felt confident of his ability, and into it he plunged after the death of Charles the Rash. Though he still spoke of his desire of marrying his son, the Dauphin, to Mary of Burgundy, it was no longer his dominant and ever-present idea. Instead of taking pains to win the good will in the heart of Mary herself, he laboured with his usual zeal and address to dispute her rights, to despoil her brusquely of one or another town in her dominions, to tamper with her servants, or excite against them the wrath of the populace. Two of the most devoted and most able amongst them, Hugonet, Chancellor of Burgundy, and Sire d'Humbercourt, were the victims of Louis the Eleventh's hostile manoeuvres and of blind hatred on the part of the Gentees and all the Princess Mary's passionate entreaties were powerless, both with the King and with the Flemings, to save them from the scaffold. And so Mary, alternately threatened or duped, attacked in her just rights, or outraged in her affections, being driven to extremity, exhibited a resolution never to become the daughter of a prince, unworthy of the confidence she, poor orphan, had placed in the spiritual tie which marked him out as her protector. I understand, said she, that my father had arranged my marriage with the emperor's son. I have no mind for any other. Louis, in his alarm, tried all sorts of means, seductive and violent, to prevent such a reverse. He went in person amongst the Walloon and Flemish provinces belonging to Mary. That I come into this country, said he to the inhabitants of Quesnoy, is for nothing but the interests of Mademoiselle de Burgundy, my well-beloved cousin and goddaughter. Of her wicked advisers, some would have her espouse the son of the Duke of Cleves, but he is a prince of far too little lustre for so illustrious a princess. I know that he has a bad sore on his leg. He is a drunkard, like all Germans, and, after drinking, he will break his glass over her head and beat her. Others would ally her with the English, the kingdom's old enemies, who all lead bad lives. There are some who would give her for her husband the emperor's son, but those princes of the imperial house are the most avaricious in the world, 
they will carry off mademoiselle de burgundy to germany a strange land and a coarse where she will know no consolation whilst your land of Ainau will be left without any lord to govern and defend it if my fair cousin were well advised she would espouse the dauphin you speak french you walloon people you want a prince of france not a german as for me i esteem the folks of Ainau more than any nation in the world there is none more noble and in my sight a hind of Ainau is worth more than a grand gentleman of any other country at the very time that he was using such flattering language to the good folks of Ainau, he was writing to the count de dammartin whom he had charged with the repression of insurrection in the country parts of ghent and Pauge. sir grand master i send you some mowers to cut down the crop you wot off put them i pray you to work and spare not some casks of wine to set them drinking and to make them drunk i pray you my friend let there be no need to return a second time to do the mowing for you are as much crown officer as i am and if i am king you are grand master damartin executed the king's orders without scruple and at the season of harvest the flemish country places were devastated little birds of heaven cries the flemish chronicler moliné ye who are wont to haunt our fields and rejoice our hearts with your amorous notes now seek out other countries get ye hence from our tillages for the king of the mowers of france hath done worse to us than do the tempests. End of chapter 25, part 8